Welcome to the program today. I hope you're having a wonderful week, a wonderful weekend, whenever you might be listening to this. It is good to have your listening ear back. Quick question, when was the last time you had planned a, a vacation to El Salvador? When was the last time you planned a vacation to El Salvador? Uh, likely, you never have, uh, because until recently, it was the murder capital of the world. Not necessarily a place you wanted to bring your, your loved ones and your dear ones. Uh, and for good reasons and for sad reasons. Uh, nonetheless, things seem to be changing quite a lot there. Uh, if you have not heard, they have a new president. His name is Nabib Bukele. Sorry if I uh, misspoke his name. But Nabib Bukele, uh, very recently elected, and as of now, he's the most popular uh, elected official basically in the whole world. And uh, he's, he's a younger man, about in his 30s or so. And uh, he appears to be a Christian believer in the one true God. And here's why I say things are changing, not only because of the, uh, the uh, person, the man who is serving as their president, but truly amazing things have taken place there. Even in his short term as their uh, president there in the Republic of El Salvador, uh, for instance, it has gone in recent time, talking about just this year, from the murder capital of the whole world to the safest country in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, talk about change, talk about transformation. It's gone from the murder capital of the world. You don't want to go to a vacation there, you don't want to spend time there, to the safest country in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, even safer than Canada, even safer than the United States, you know, right where uh, I am here recording this in the middle of Pennsylvania, El Salvador statistically according to recent reports, is now safer in terms of murder and homicide. For instance, to give you a stat, this comes from uh, Fast Stats, uh, cdc.gov. More or less that uh, per 100,000 people here in the United States, there's about six murders. Currently in El Salvador, because of the uh, transformation and the work that uh, President Bukele has done there thus far, they're down to about two homicides per 100,000 people. Now, of course, they have a, a much smaller population than uh, the United States, but talking about scale, they are uh, at two per 100,000 people in terms of homicide. That, that is their rate, whereas the United States, uh, as of a, a recent uh, study, is at six per 100,000 people in terms of homicide or murder. And so things have changed quite a lot under the leadership of Nabib Bukele. And many nations and many governments and congresses and senators and presidents around the world are acknowledging his leadership, even if they do so with a little bit of an edge or disagreement or envy, because he's very clear that the first thing he does is he seeks God's wisdom. And that is what he said in a recent interview with Tucker, Tucker Carlson and talking about the economy, his plan for the economy next having fixed the crime problem, is to work on the economy, a very extremely poor country. Um, and yet, he says, here's what we're going to do first. We're going to seek God's wisdom. And yeah, people don't like this. The uh, secularists, the uh, anti-God, anti-human, uh, uh, wild, crazy people we have here, they don't like that. They don't want to seek God's wisdom uh, first, second, or last. They just don't want to do that at all. But he says that's number one on his list. And he really actually put um, uh, feet on the ground. Uh, rubber meets the road type of policy here. Here's what he did. He used the military of El Salvador to either arrest or execute 70,000 gang members. That's what he did. He took charge and he realized, like we all should, that peace comes through strength. Now here's why I bring that up in particular on this uh, Christ the King radio program. is because he then is going on uh, talking about his future plans and the nature of his work there as the president of El Salvador. And he went through a uh, wild ride to get there. So many people trying to stop him, so many people trying to harm or persecute him, keeping him from uh, the office of president because of his stances and because of what his plans were to make the country safe and effective and uh, more pure more morally and ethically upright, no longer standing out in the in the world as the you know murder capital of the entire world. He didn't want that to happen. 
And so his first uh, line of business was to deal with the gang violence, and this is where you know MS-13 had had a huge presence. And he points out that these MS-13 gang members literally worship Satan. One of them, one of the gang members, uh, left the gang because uh, he had realized, and I won't go into details, uh, but he realized that this gang was uh, literally worshiping Satan. They weren't just committing crimes and trying to get money. They were religiously demonic. They were doing dark and evil things, things that even this gang member was not willing to submit himself to. And uh, President Nabi Bukele uh, likens his work uh, as, as the president there to uh, building a wall. And he had uh, gave this uh, illustration of this mountain that was uh, foreseeably going to uh, collapse and uh, create a terrible landslide and was going to destroy homes of the people who lived near it. And these engineers uh, decided to build a wall to help uh, hem in the mountain and to um, uh, keep the land firm and steadfast so, so as to prevent that landslide. And uh, he more or less said that a wall, any wall, no matter how nice it is, no matter how well built it is, uh, in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it's going to be damaged, it's going to be cracked, it's going to be leaning, things are going to break, um, it's going to be used and abused, it's going to be out in the elements every day of every year. And so he wasn't sure about this wall because why not just rehome the people, why not just have them move, you know, this, you know nature is unpredictable uh, to humans and this wall in a matter of decades is going to be functionally useless. And one of the engineers told him, uh, you know, dear president, uh, that's why we're going to maintain the wall. That's why we're going to maintenance it every year. And whenever there's emergencies, whenever there is a disaster, uh, whenever we notice cracks and fault lines and things that are going to um, uh, hurt the integrity of this wall, uh, we as engineers and construction workers and those that are going to work with our hands are going to maintain this wall. People can stay where they're living and not have to, you know, uh, upend their whole life and move out of the area, but we're going to maintain it. And uh, President Nabib uh, took this illustration of what he was dealing with with infrastructure and with this uh, natural disaster type thing, and he said that that same principle relates to um, his work with the crime and with the gangs. Is okay, he's had this initial success, and he gives the credit to God. He, he literally says that, um, you know, uh, arresting and, and, and prosecuting 70,000 gang members uh, who have no regard for human life and who don't care whether they hurt or harm civilians, grandmothers, whoever it is, their own family, uh, so long as they uh, continue in, in their uh, life of crime and gang violence. He says, how do you, how do you, how do you hem in 70,000 of them? He said, yeah, we had plans and we had procedures and there were different phases we had to do uh, from to move our country from the most unsafe place to live to the most safe place to live. There was all sorts of things that went into it, but he said, this was the real deal. It was a miracle. It was a miracle from heaven. God helped us. And he said, that initial success, and praise be to God, it has to be maintained. Uh, if, you, if you just let it go, it's going to be like that wall in a number of decades. If you don't uh, touch it up and you don't give it what it needs, it's going to be functionally useless. And so he seeks to maintain his work. So here we are in the United States, and we are being bypassed in terms of safety and in terms of a government that will actually prosecute crimes rather than, uh, you know, wink their eyes at it. Uh, we're in the midst of uh, what has been uh, falsely labeled Pride Month. Uh, it's not Pride Month. It's, this is the month of June, uh, and there's a lot of good things in June. June is a wonderful summer month. Father's Day is in June. This is the month of June. But uh, we have been um, more or less taken over. Uh, in the sense of by uh, people who don't know left from right, people who don't know uh, natural law, people who don't know uh, the Word of God and, and really basic common sense, but we have been so weakened and demoralized that we have been overcome, taken over, and that our flag has been replaced with uh, an invader's flag, truly. And uh, now we have to pretend like the month of June is Pride Month. And, and here's why that happened. Because America, as, as great and as Christian as it might have been, uh, the work has not been maintained. We have been overcome by ideologies and by lies and deceit that have destroyed our country from the inside out. 
uh, countries that hate us, countries that don't want us to exist, countries that don't want to see the Christian faith thrive in the United States of America, uh, they don't have to lift a finger. They don't have to fire a single firearm. They don't have to uh, send bombs. They don't have to um, do anything. Um, all they have to do is let us go, is to give us over to our own vain uh, ideologies and lies that will eat us uh, from the inside out like worms and like gangrene. Uh, because we have not maintained the inheritance and the heritage that has been graciously given to us by the one true and living God. And so uh, this is not actually Pride Month. Um, this is the month of June. This is a, a month in the summer. Um, and we ought to enjoy what June is. We ought to enjoy, like the scripture says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it and not let invaders and perpetrators uh, pretend that they can overcome this country. But this starts one person at a time um, actually saying, no, not going to do that. Not going to bow to your flag. Not going to bow to your ideology. Not going to pretend that this month is any different than it's always been. Um, the United States of America is a fundamentally Christian nation. And yes, we, like the prodigal son, have lost our ever-living mind and uh, taken the inheritance from our father and spent it in all sorts of unjust, unholy ways. But here's where the United States of America basically is. Hopefully, we are the prodigal son eating the pig's food and starting to realize, man, I should go home to dad. That's hopefully where we might be getting in the story, because we are certainly the prodigal son, uh, you know, born into a wonderful life, given more than we could ever account for, and yet we have become fat, lazy, and a bunch of ingrates. And so the Christian heritage and the freedoms and the immaculate nation that this was, we took for granted. We didn't maintain it. We didn't treat it with um, love. We didn't fear God. We didn't obey his commandments. And so God has justly given us over to our own lusts. And we have become ugly and gross and disgusting. And in our streets this month, we'll be pouring out the dregs of society uh, who need the Lord Jesus Christ, yet who nonetheless in their sins are, as the scripture says, uh, degenerate and of a reprobate mind. And they're doing things that we ought not even talk about and that are worthy of death. And so uh, here's one thing you can do in June. Read Romans chapter 1. If not every day, do it every week. Look what Romans chapter 1 says. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I am I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, un against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. 
but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their flesh to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations. Uh, for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Thus far is the reading of God's holy word. And here's what we need to understand, uh, listener, is that God's word here in Romans chapter 1 directly proclaims that all moral decline and all insanity and all madness of heart and all hatred against mother and father and all giving up the natural use of men and women in God's good, beautiful design to do things that are unseemly, shameless, and unspeakable. All of that, wrap all that up and put it in a big ugly bag, all of that comes from leaving behind God. Leaving behind God. You could look over uh, the, the moral wasteland of the 20th century where you see Holocaust after Holocaust, you see communism everywhere, you see um, all sorts of terrible things done in the concentration camps, uh, not only in Germany, but in Russia, in China, in Italy, all sorts of terrible things. And all that wrapped up is this, they forgot God. They forgot God. And anytime someone says, I don't want to talk about God, I don't want to no, God, I don't want to have anything to do with your Bible. It's because they are gunning for his job. It's because they want to be their own God. And when that happens, uh, people give up the one true and living God to serve creatures, namely themselves. And the more you run from God, not only do you become less godly and less Christ-like, but you actually eventually become, uh, functionally speaking, uh, less and less human, less and less humane, and so that you will begin even to worship creatures, animals, reptiles, uh, four-footed beasts, because God gives you over to a mind that does not work. You will still claim to be wise, and yet you'll become fools. All sorts of PhDs, all sorts of doctors, all sorts of people honored in the academy are the architects for the modern world of ugliness and of moral degradation. They had PhDs, they had masters, they had uh, all sorts of titles and seats and chairs and all sorts of wonderful accolades of this world and yet they had reprobate minds that did not work. Just study sometime Dr. John Muddy. Uh, just study sometime uh, Judith Butler. Just study sometime Simone de Bar. Uh, all of these people, uh, and we could go on and name more. You think of Nietzsche, you think of Marx, you think of Charles Darwin. Uh, these are uh, minds that help make up the modern world, and yet uh, in their wordplay, and in their writings, and in their so called scholarship, so called knowledge, uh, what they actually made was a godless world, a feminized world a sodomized world, a world that is cut off from the, the truth of the living God and given over, what we read here in Romans chapter 1, given over by God four times, I believe it says, to do things that are unseemly, to have a mind that is debased or reprobate, and to do things that are not only shameful but are worthy of death. 
this is the Romans 1 world that not only Paul found himself in 2,000 years ago as he looked around the Roman Empire, but it's the world we find ourselves looking around the American Empire that has been taken over uh, by, by the uh, global gay uh, agenda that is just completely rotting the minds of, sadly, our youth, our young people, uh, so that they think kindness is affirmation of ugliness, that they think that compassion is coming alongside someone who is walking off a cliff and, and making sure that they walk off that cliff with a nice arm around their shoulders. Uh, this is not the kindness of God. The very next chapter of Romans, ch- Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it says that the riches of God's kindness and patience, these things are meant to lead you to repentance. And so uh, when, when the lavender mafia, when the, um, uh, when the alphabet jihad people tell you that um, you aren't really representing God's love and kindness whenever you rebuke sin, whenever you call out a spade as a spade, uh, just remember, true kindness and true patience leads to repentance. If the love, kindness, and patience, so called, that the world is telling us to give, does not lead to repentance, then biblically speaking, it is not real love, it is not real kindness, kindness, and it is not real Patience, because all of those things, which are true virtues that come from God, lead to repentance, which, if I'll remind you, is turning away from our sin. And as we turn away from sin, we naturally turn towards God by a work of the Holy Spirit. But notice in Romans chapter 1, the religious problem, the worship problem of not giving thanks to God. Something so simple, something that, uh, you know, we ought to know when we're two, three years old, that everything that God gives us, we should give thanks. Give God thanks for the hamburger on our plate. God Give, give God thanks for the roof over our head. Give God thanks for the t-shirt on my back. The word says this, when we forget something so basic, so fundamental as giving thanks back to God, that's when our minds stop working because then we become resentful, selfish ingrates. And when you live... 10, 20, 40, 50 years as a resentful, selfish ingrate, you are given over then to a life of misery, bitterness, and rebellion. And the scripture says you forgot God, you didn't give thanks, so you became selfish. And when you are selfish, then you become miserable because truly selfish, prideful people are miserable because their whole life is about them and they're not perfect and they know it. But they're trying to live as if they are God, as if they are perfect, and they know they're not. So it it does make for a miserable, lonely life. You know, you chase people away when you're miserable and selfish. And then you're given over to what is known as a vice list here in Romans chapter 1, or a, a list of sins. And among them is being boastful, being foolish, being faithless, being ruthless, being heartless, being a gossip, uh, being someone like we see in the streets today, someone who invents evil. (laughs) Man, I mean, there's so many sins listed here, and yet uh, those that are given over by God to a reprobate mind because they don't give thanks, because they don't worship God, but they worship themselves and become selfish, and they become haters, and they become miserable, they will then go on to uh, invent evil, and down the line, eventually, Uh, One of the worst symptoms of forgetting God and living godlessly is that you will give up the natural use of men and women and the God-designed rules of men and women, and men will do shameless things with men, and women even, women who are more uh, romantically conservative, you could say, even they will exchange the natural relations for those that are contrary or against nature, women with women and men with men. And this, uh, Paul says, they receive in themselves the due penalty for their error. But as we close out the program today, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you're not married, if you're single, and and the Lord is calling you to marriage, then get married. Uh, Men, find yourselves a godly woman. Uh, Ladies, find yourselves a godly man. And if you're married, then have children and teach them the way of of Yahweh. Teach them the way of the Lord. And what that means, and this message goes out to absolutely everybody, is that we must understand and receive the forgiveness of God. Yes, we live in troublesome times, and we live in times where the lies are thick, 
and the culture of deception and ugliness seems to be at our very ears, you know, and it's just every day, right? Well, guess what? That's the perfect place to proclaim the sweet forgiveness of God. That's the perfect place to proclaim his forgiveness. And, and a simple definition, though you can't define God's forgiveness, just like you can't totally define God's love, but this is what I'm teaching my children. God's forgiveness is when he takes away my sins and he chooses to remember them no more. God's forgiveness is when he takes away my sins and chooses to remember them no more. That's what we can tell to the world that is hurting, that is broken, that is living contrary to nature, and they know it, but we need to remind them there is a God in heaven who can forgive every single one of your sins, regardless of the dark alley that you've went down, regardless of the thick lies that you've believed. God will forgive through Jesus Christ. His blood is more powerful. The Lord be with you. Remember these things for Jesus' sake.